Yeah, just a reminder for everybody before we get started to please keep your video off as well as your um, audio muted so that there's no distractions during the presentation. You can use the chat function if you have any questions while the presentation is going on. And if we need to, we'll interrupt for those. Otherwise, we'll keep them to the end. As well as at the end, we will allow you to unmute yourselves and share your video, ask any questions. And without any further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, David Lowenstein, on well and less known in insects of the Midwest. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome, David. All right. Thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna pull up my screen. Some of the things we're gonna hear about tonight are insects that I've come across or not come across very often, and others are for recent additions that um, some of you might have seen. So we'll get a chance to explore some of the diversity in the insect world, although not everything, because we'll be here for hours to talk about it all. I'm an entomologist. Uh, I am with MSU Extension. I'm based in Macomb County. And we have three main things for tonight. We'll talk a bit about what actually is an insect, because people sometimes use the terms insect when they mean spiders or any other creepy crawly thing. Technically, there's some morphology or body parts that actually make an insect. And we'll talk both about the bad insects and the not bad insects. So I'd like to hear from some of you, probably in the chat, but when you think about insects, what are some adjectives or things that come to mind and get a sense of where people are with their comfort or discomfort level with insects? Okay, six-legged, holes in my plants, pollinators. Okay, so we got the, the positive there. We have some technical answers about insects. Your wigs are creepy. Uh, they can be, they hide under leaves and they're a surprise. Balance of nature, That I like that one, that they, they keep things going, but they also cause destruction. Problem with bees at my bird feeder this year. Yep, certain times of the year, the honeybees especially, they, uh, they're looking for water. So some of you have already got to the next part. You might already know what, what makes an insect, but I'll, I'll review it anyway. All insects have three body parts. They have a head, they have a thorax, and they have an abdomen, and that differs from spiders, which only have two body parts. And uh, insects have six legs. So a couple of you were clued into that. The legs are always attached to the thorax, the section in the middle. Many insects have wings, but not every single insect will have wings. So as adults, probably majority of them do, but as immatures, they do not um, have wings. They they also have segmented bodies, which is what the three parts are. And within the abdomen and the thorax, there are different segments. They have paired legs. An insect will all, won't have one leg and not one on the other side, unless, of course, it lost its leg to a predator or it just got um, cut off somehow. An exoskeleton, uh, they grow by molting, which is something that we don't do, but insects do. And insects are cold blooded. And that's why the only place you'll see insects in the winter in Michigan is the inside of your home or someone else's home or a basement. Uh, there are a couple exceptions like snow fleas, which can be found on snow, but that is not particularly common. So here again are the three body parts of an insect. This is on a bee. There's a lot of other anatomical things that are unique to insects, but I don't think anyone came here tonight to hear me lecture about the tibia and the tarsus and the sternum and how to identify things based on that. But if you did, 
we could talk afterwards if there's time. So I talked earlier why spiders are not insects. Spiders are kind of cool too, uh, but spiders have eight legs and they have two body parts. They have um, a cephalothorax, which is a combined head and thorax, and they have an abdomen. Michigan has lots and lots of insect species. These are just a couple of the orders of insects that are found in Michigan. And this, if anyone here is a Latin speaker, feel free to put in the chat if you know what some of the um, prefixes are, like colio, and ortho, and neuro, hemi, because that helps determine what the type of insects within that group might share in common. Um, so Terra means uh, winged, aptera are non-winged. So like Dermaptera, the earwigs, no, no wings on them. Uh, in case you're curious what some of these are, mayflies, flies, ants, bees, and wasps, beetles, um, crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers, lacewings, plant-sucking insects, thrips, roaches, and termites, fleas, mantids, stick insects, bark lice, and caddisflies. So I would guess that of all the orders listed here, everyone on the Zoom room was probably seen at least six to eight of them in person, perhaps some more. When it comes to the insect life cycle, there are two main uh, ways that insects develop. There is complete and incomplete metamorphosis. So complete metamorphosis is when insects lay eggs, and once those eggs hatch into a larva, they look nothing at all like the adult. The larva might be grub-like, it might be a caterpillar, it might look like a worm. It enters its pupal life stage, and there's immense physiological changes. Uh, so pretty unique that an insect can go from this worm or caterpillar to a beetle or a butterfly. Uh, so things that undergo complete metamorphosis are beetles, ants, uh, flies. And then there's the simple or gradual incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, and that's things like hemiptera, the plant sucking insects, uh, katydids, grasshoppers. And that's where after they hatch from an egg, they look sort of like a miniature version of the adult, except they can't fly and they can't reproduce. Sometimes their color is a little different as well. So we're going to move next on to some of the, uh, the troublemakers of the insect world. Uh, the first one is the Colorado potato beetle. Has anyone seen that? Or does anyone grow potatoes and have seen that? I would guess if anyone who grew up in the country and had potatoes, you probably- I had them in Massachusetts, but not here. They do have uh, Colorado potato beetles in, in Michigan, and, and they do have them in Massachusetts as well. Um, I don't know where they are worse, but I know in Wisconsin, the potato beetle is a major problem in some of the potato production areas. I don't know in comparison here. Um, one place where they don't have Colorado potato beetle is way out west in uh, Oregon and Washington, some of the potato producing areas. So they're fortunate to not have the Colorado potato beetle there. For those who have not seen Colorado potato beetle, uh, this is beetle, as the name describes. It's actually a, a, a pretty insect. Nice orange face, black uh, lines going down the abdomen. But the main problem is this larval life stage here. These things can defoliate potato foliage to, to nothing, almost like hornworms. So this is a severely defoliated potato plant. And you can see a larva here, 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 there, another one there, there, here. So all over. Uh, by the time these get to late instar larvae or the really big larvae, uh, it's pretty much too late to do anything. And major problem uh, in certain potato production areas that they just have to spray regularly uh, to manage this pest. Usually not as much of an issue to a resident who's growing a potato plant or two because they like areas where there's lots and lots of uh, potatoes. 
and I see a comment, lots of potato beetles at the Tollgate Farm. I'll have to take a look next time I'm out there and those potato plants are, are mature. The, the reason I profile the Colorado potato beetle is because of some interesting history behind it. So the potato beetle uh, was part of a propaganda campaign in World War II, uh, where the Germans believed that the Allied troops were going to be dropping potato beetles to devastate the potato crop um, in Germany and other places uh, in Central Europe. So they released these really interesting propaganda flyers um, showing potato beetles, Americanized beetles. I don't speak fluent German, but basically how uh, to protect their crops and watch out for this American campaign. I, I don't know quite how the idea came to fruition, but that wasn't uh, a plan. Bombs are a lot more effective than, uh, than beetles and uh, beetles were not dropped in that area. Um, but you can see just how much of an impact this beetle has on potatoes that they were very concerned about that. And uh, more recently, uh, some of the political strife in Ukraine and, and Russia, they, um, they have a term, the Ukrainians, for uh, unwanted uh, pests. And uh, they call them kolorodi after the, the Colorado potato beetle. So if you know anyone Ukrainian and they call you a kolorodi, um, not a compliment if you're from Colorado, but rather you're a pest uh, like a Colorado potato beetle. Here again are just um, some more pictures um, about that. And probably the reason that these would make it to Europe or have made it there is just accidental entry. You know, They come with troops or get put in shipping as opposed to an actively trying to drop uh, invasive species. The next problem, is the fall armyworm. Uh, this is one that was a concern in some parts of Michigan, um, more of a bigger issue in the Plains states this year. But this is a pest that is not native to our area. Uh, it spends the winter in the south, like uh, Tennessee and, and, and points south typically. Uh, but the problem with armyworms is there's not usually one of them. There's hundreds or thousands and uh, they can strip sod bare relatively quickly. And they can strip other crops bare too. Uh, so some places that had uh, armyworms, uh, it was kind of a surprise. Was this grubs? Did they strip the lawns really quickly? And this is a picture from a Michigan golf course. Uh, one of the uh, tea cu or cups by the, um, I believe the tea. And these are all armyworms that were crawling on there. And they made it here in the end of August from one of those tropical fronts that came up from the south. So these get blown in by the, the jet stream. Uh, if you have a newer sod lawn, that you're a greater risk of damage for them. Asiatic garden beetle is, an, or is another problem in the Midwest. This is also one that's not native to here, although it's been in the US for a while, but not in Michigan regularly. Um, until about 15 years ago. Very similar to the Japanese beetle in terms of its life cycle. It spends the uh, winter and much of its lifetime as a grub underground feeding on roots. It emerges in the summer, but unlike Japanese beetle, it is active at night. So if you have a porch light, you probably see these brownish beetles flying there and they're not very bright, uh, the beetles. They'll just fly inside your house uh, when you open the door very easy to swat down uh, with your hand. Uh, the next two are more recent ones uh, that are starting to be an issue. This is elm seed uh, bug. It was actually first detected in Oakland County in 2015. I've had a couple reports of uh, elm seed bug this year. Uh, has anyone seen this one? Because it seems to be more of an issue in Southeast Michigan than elsewhere. And it's a lot like the brown marmorated stink bug and western conifer seed bug and box elder bug. Just an additional pest um, or insect rather that congregates on the side of buildings or the garage at this time of year with the decreasing daylight. Mostly on elms as the name describes but uh, sometimes lindens and oaks 
Uh, the way to identify it in its adult life stage is it has what looks like an X with its wings coming across and it has alternating white and black on its abdomen. So sort of like brown marmorated stink bug, which is white and black, uh, but this one has red on it. If you see a bunch of these in the side of your home, not really anything to be concerned about. They're just looking for a place to spend the winter. One that's been a very recent addition to the, the problematic ones are these uh, Maloe oil beetles. In the last two weeks alone, I've had 10 reports of oil beetles. People talking or calling, emailing, walking in our office, uh, asking, what are these? I'm seeing tens and hundreds of them in my lawn or in parks. And I was kind of surprised because in the two and a half years I've been with MSU, I have not heard about these aggregating in the uh, the fall months. And I spoke to a couple other colleagues here in Michigan and in Wisconsin, and they're seeing some of these aggregating this year. As larvae, they actually are parasit parasites of bees. Uh, so they feed on bee larvae, uh, not very nice to the, to the bees. And the reason they get their name of uh, blister beetles sometimes is they produce a compound uh, as a defense mechanism. And that compound uh, has a toxin in it that if you're to touch it with your bare hands, uh, you will get blisters that could form. So definitely if you see lots of these big black beetles uh, just in a park or in lawn, use gloves, don't, don't touch them. Just a funny story about them just from today. Uh, so I teach an entomology class <clears throat> at a community college once a week. And this week, our section is beetles. And I've been looking for blister beetles. You know, they, they're a nice addition to have in the lab. And I didn't see any. And right before I'm leaving the office today, someone comes in with a jar of these saying, I found these beetles. What are they? So pretty good coincidence that I'm looking for the beetles and someone comes in with exactly what I need. I didn't even have to collect them. And as anyone look closely at this picture, do you notice something unusual about the beetle on this right side picture here? What do you see that uh, sticks out to you? Well, I will draw it on the screen if no one spots it. And then you'll probably go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Right now I see it. So, right there. Did anyone spot that? Yep. Has a passenger, another insect on its back. And this is a really interesting case uh, because this is not the same species but it is an even smaller beetle uh, from the genus Pedilus. And what does this beetle do? It's attracted to the oils that this blister beetle produces and it feeds on them, it doesn't get hurt by them. So you have this beetle that produces a toxin and that's to keep away other pests, but there's a second beetle that likes those oils and will feed on them. And it just shows you how specialized uh, some insects are that they can take advantage of these unique adaptations on individual species. We're going to talk a little bit about the types of damage that you might find on plants. Sometimes you see the insects and you see the damage. Sometimes you might just see the damage and wonder, well, what's going on? Uh, what could have caused this? Uh, the first type of damage that, that insects can cause on plants is chewing damage. In extreme cases, uh, like tomato hornworm, and I believe there's one somewhere on the plant here. Uh, here's one over there and over there. They just defoliate the whole thing. There's nothing left, just looks like a stem. You may not see the hornworms, but you'll see the poop balls, the frass uh, around the plant. If you're just seeing little piles of frass, but no insect, there's a good chance that there was a hornworm or a very large caterpillar on there and it's walked away to another plant or it's pupated already. There's also chewing insects like these uh, cucumber beetles. So they can cause what looks like little pieces of the leaf to go away, or they can feed more broadly on the leaves. And then there's saw flies, 
which uh, look like the leaves have been skeletonized. They feed on one side of the leaf tissue, leaving the other side intact. They're also the piercing sucking insects, things that have not a mandible for chewing, but a straw for sucking plant juices uh, from. Often they have an X pattern on their abdomen, kind of like that elm seed uh, beetle. So this is a tarnished plant bug here. This is a stink bug that fe is feeding on um, some peach. And this is a four line plant bug. So damage from piercing sucking insects can be on the leaves and typically are circles. Sometimes you can see the hole that's a, a little different color and that's the actual part where the proboscis, that straw they have, has pierced the leaf. Other times the damage on the fruit and vegetables might look like concentric circles or bumps uh, or other deformations that result from uh, the plant juices coming into contact with the saliva of the insect. Finally, there's insects that transmit viruses. Most commonly, this is done by leaf hoppers and by thrips or aphids. And these are small jumping insects and they're not affected by the virus, but they carry a bacteria or a virus and that causes the plants to change in color or have a mottled appearance. Sometimes these circles on here. And this is how the virus uh, works. So the beetle, the, let's say this case, the aphid, it feeds on the plant tissues. And as it's feeding, it's transmitting viral particles into the plant. So this plant was previously clean, didn't have an issue. And then it goes to the next plant and does the same thing. So in the case of viruses, you can't treat a virus when it comes to uh, plants. You either pull the plant out or you treat for the insect that transmit the virus. So you have to know who is the one that's causing the virus to figure out how to stop that from happening. The last pest insect I wanted to mention is the squash vine borer. A uh, really pretty insect, bright red, but it is not a wasp. People often confuse this one. Uh, that it's a stinging insect, but it's actually a, a moth. Uh, how you might know it's present is time of year, typically January or July to early August is when it's active. And if your squash plants are just starting to wilt without any other symptoms, uh, look at the base of the stems. And if you see what looks like a hole in there or a browning and a weakened stem, open that stem apart and you'll probably see a larvae or a brown frass, the remnants of the poop. I've talked a bit about some of the, the bad insects, and this is not a complete description of all of them. We're just talking about a subset that you might come across. It is important to know that an insect on a plant does not mean that you have a problem. Even if it is a bad insect, uh, just a few of them, can damage plants, but maybe not at the level that a plant's going to experience um, death quickly. So avoid being the gardener in this photo here who has a kill first, ask later mentality, especially if there are no symptoms. And I do see a question. What benefit is it to the insect to inject a virus into the plant? It's of no benefit uh, whatsoever uh, to the insect. Uh, the virus is just hitching a ride and the insect happens to uh, be the source, not where the virus reproduces, but the uh, transportation uh, for that virus. So we're gonna focus next on natural enemies. Uh, these are also called beneficial insects, but they're not exclusively insects. They're natural enemies that can be in the form of um, bacteria like bacillus. So natural enemies are living. They attack different life stages of insect pests, but most commonly the eggs and the larvae because it's easier to overcome the defenses of them relative to an adult. And with the right type of habitat, natural enemy populations can be self-sustaining. We'll talk a bit about what the right habitat is at the end. Using natural enemies to manage insect populations is called biological control. 
So for those here who are Extension Master Gardeners, your IPM section would have talked a bit about biocontrol. And this is when you're using a beneficial insect to reduce populations of herbivores, or most frequently herbivores. And one common way that can happen is with parasitoid wasps. So there are parasitoids uh, that are just ambient in, the, in nature, and they live as adults. Usually they're wasps, sometimes they're flies, and they'll lay an egg or multiple eggs either on the outside or the inside of their host. In this case, the host is a pupa of a fly. The egg is developed, then develops into a larva and basically uh, feeds on the pupa. So that pupa, which is going to become a fly, isn't anymore because this parasite is now feeding on it. And in the process of the feeding, uh, the larva will develop, the pupa will die, the, so the host insect will die, and then eventually an adult will pop out of that. It's a pretty terrible way to go if you're the host and that you get eaten alive, <laughs> but uh, good for the, the insect. And sometimes one single wasp uh, can reproduce and cause hundreds of wasps to come out of an egg mess. So a really quick way for a, a pest to be managed. This is just to scale on a, um, I believe this is a yarrow flower. And this is just one of these single florets. And this is the size of some parasitoids, a millimeter, two millimeters in length. And this is a cabbage looper with a larvae on the outside of that. Sometimes the parasitoids develop on the outside, some on the inside. They can't switch between inside or outside. The types of things that parasitoids control uh, includes virtually all types of pest insects, aphids, cabbage worms. There's parasitoids that manage uh, emerald ash borer, um, stink bugs, tree scales, white flies. The one thing about them is that they specialize on only one type of species or a particular genus. There's not going to be a parasitoid that attacks lady beetles and also attacks stink bugs and also attacks grasshoppers. To overcome the defenses of an insect, you have to specialize on not being killed by those natural defenses. And that's why they only focus on a, a small group to attack. The parasitoid life cycle is pretty quick. It can, it can be anywhere from uh, two weeks to four weeks that they can go from egg to adult. And they can lay lots of eggs quickly in their adult life cycle. Everyone here who has a garden has parasitoids in your garden. You just might not know it. Uh, at this time of the year, the parasitoids are most likely in their overwintering uh, life stage. And the reason you don't notice them is because of their size. Some of them are, are you know, the size of a period in a sentence. They're just a speck. And the only way to find them is if you see the damaged host or if you're using a sweep net to try to catch them. You can't control where parasitoids move unless you have a greenhouse. Then you can release parasitoids in the greenhouse, and if the vents are closed, they're going to stay in and find the pests that they're looking for. So how do you attract parasitoids to your garden? The key way is through nectar. So in addition to attacking a type of host insect, they need that sugar to survive, and they like flowers to feed on. So in addition to nectar in your own garden, encourage your neighbors to also add beneficial plants that have nectar. So the same type of plants that are good for pollinators are often the same plants that are good for parasitoids. And as you can imagine, a parasitoid that's a fraction of an inch cannot move very far on its own. So if there aren't the right resources and the, uh, for that parasitoid nearby, it's not going to be present uh, unless it happens to get blown in by the wind. I'm going to highlight one example of a parasitoid and biological control, and that is the samurai wasp, Trisulcus japonicus. Before I came to MSU, I spent three years in Oregon of researching this parasitoid and how it can be redistributed to manage the invasive brown marmorated stink bug. The reason that this parasitoid was chosen to be released and to control BMSB both in Oregon, Michigan, and other states is because it is native to the same parts of the world where BMSB is from, uh, 
parts of Eastern Asia, like China, South Korea, Japan. Uh, it's an egg parasitoid, which means that it lays its eggs in the eggs of stink bug. Fortunately for those in Michigan, it was found here just a few years back, and there are scientists in the Department of Entomology at MSU who are currently working to uh, redistribute this parasitoid in places where BMSB or brown marmorated stink bug is causing economic damage in orchards and vegetable crops. I believe the closest places to Oakland County um, are some of the orchards uh, near Romeo and uh, Northern Macomb. So this is a special type of, of biocontrol. Give me one moment. Okay, thank you for bearing with me. So this type of biocontrol, where you're bringing a non-native insect to manage a non-native insect is called a classical biocontrol. Uh, I have the science -y term about what that is in the first bullet point. You might be wondering why introduce something else? Isn't that gonna cause more problems? Now, historically, yes, because there wasn't any research done. People traveled to other parts of the world and went, oh, here's an insect that's feeding on a scale or, or stink bug. I'm gonna just bring it back to the US and release it. Now, in the last 60 to 100 years, there's a lot more stringent regulations about that. So for any insect to get released that's not native to the United States, it has to undergo years of testing in a controlled environment to determine, is it going to be effective in the new climate? Is it going to impact any non-target insects, native species that might be closely related or not closely related? Is it likely to survive? So this parasitoid wasp, the samurai, was tested for probably five or six years, and then it made it on its own independently. So kind of too late, but uh, thankfully the, the lab results show that it's not likely to uh, cause more problems, except there may be one or two types of native stink bugs that it might also be able to develop in. And this type of biocontrol, classical biocontrol, is not just for uh, insects. There are weevils and other uh, moths that have been released to uh, feed on invasive plant species um, in Michigan, as well as in the West, in the US. Now, when looking for these insects, uh, it's pretty hard to find a microscopic wasp. If you have a good eye, you might have noticed it here. And when I show this figure in person, most people don't tend to notice it because it's a big screen away. But this is that samurai wasp on an apple leaf after it was released uh, in the area. And the way that we know that the samurai wasp is effective is through impacts to the egg life stage that it attacks. So ordinarily, a brown marmorated stink bug egg mass has about 25 to 28 light green eggs. When they're not parasitized, they get these light black triangles on them. And then the nymphs of stink bug hatch out. But when there is a parasitoid wasp of the samurai, it will guard the eggs for a few days. You'll see this, you see a tiny speck that seems to just be hanging out by an egg mass, whether that's stink bug or a different egg mass, good chance that's a parasitoid. The eggs will also change color to dark black. And from there, a wasp will, de will develop from each egg. So at present, this samurai wasp is in 13 states and two Canadian provinces, including across the river in Ontario. And we also use these sticky cards to search for the parasitoid, but they're a major pain because the uh, features to identify the samurai wasp are bumps on the thorax and features on the antennae, which often get crushed when they're on the sticky card. Okay. Another type of really interesting wasp, and one that you can see uh, without a magnifying glass, are ichnomonids and braconid wasps. These are the largest parasitoids that we have, and they are identified by the number of antennae on their head. Now, you might be thinking, well, how, how am I going to count antennae? That, like that, that seems like something only an entomologist would do. But you can, they have anywhere from 15 to 30 antennal segments. Sometimes the antennae will be half the size of the body. 
are almost as long, which no other uh, wasp has antennae uh, that long. They also have venation on their wings, so sometimes a lot of it. Uh, so this here, this is a wasp that parasitizes aphids, and they have what's called the stigma, this darkened um, area on each of their forewings. And does anyone know what's going on over here with this parasitoid? What are some thoughts as to what it's doing? Or who it might be attacking? Correct and incorrect answers are welcomed. Going after emerald ash borer, that's a, that's a really good guess. Any other ideas? Sliding ovipositor into larvae. Okay, so Lucy and Rose, you are both on the right track. So it is in fact searching for a host and right now it has put its ovipositor and it's parasitizing a larva, not, not emerald ash borer in, uh, in this case. Now, if you're a wasp, and your host is under wood, how do you find that host? What are your thoughts as to what this does? It, that's pretty energy intensive to just stick your ovipositor into wood over and over again. How would it know if there's a larva nearby? You got it, Vib vibration. So it uses its antennae and it drums with its antennae on the wood. And when it hears the right frequency, of a larva being beneath there, it'll stick its ovipositor within. It'll never actually see the, um, the host insect, but it'll lay its eggs within the larva and go away. Only some ichnomonids um, have that life type of laying eggs into larvae in wood. Most lay eggs to free form insects that are in the wild. You can tell both of these apart by a, an extra segment on the, on the wing. Ichnomonids have what's called two of these recurrent veins, and Braconids only have one. You just need a hand lens to, um, to check that out. Another really interesting kind of wasps are Chrysidids. These look a lot like bees, but they don't have hairs that are branched on their bodies. We have two main types in Michigan. We have the beautiful blue-green uh, chrysidid wasp, which has these pits or dots throughout its body. And we have the blue-green one with orange on its abdomen. Uh, unfortunately, not a good thing for bees because they attack the uh, nests of bees and wasps and they're uh, a parasite. But they do look really beautiful uh, when they're in the wild. The next cool wasp is the great golden digger wasp. We have these outside of our demo garden in Macomb County. They nest in sandy soil and, uh, and gravel. And I'm gonna show you a video. This is an adult great golden digger. She flicks her wings quite a bit and uh, she makes this nest uh, that's about the diameter of her body in the ground. You can see here, there's three different uh, digger wasp nests. So when there's one, often there's multiples, but each wasp makes her own nest and she brings a katydid to her nest. So I'll show you what a katydid is in the next slide in case you're not sure. They're basically an insect that is the size of her body um, or a little smaller that she stings with her ovipositor, drags back to the nest, lays an egg on it. The egg feeds on that refrigerated or paralyzed katydid and uh, the katydid dies in the process. Or excuse me, the egg doesn't feed, the egg hatches and the larva feeds on it. So this is one type of katydid, uh, one that looks a lot like a leaf. Uh, katydids can be recognized by their very long antennae. Unfortunately, with the colors here, it's not very easy to see, but this is one of the antennae and it extends almost to the back of the body. So katydids have the longest antennae out of all orthopterans or crickets, gra uh, grasshoppers, katydids. Grasshoppers have short antennae and crickets have medium-sized antennae, and they have what's called cerci, these two appendages sticking out of the back of their body. Sometimes people confuse crickets 
and roaches because they look brown and uh, they have a similar body type, head facing down. But roaches do not have these long things in the back, or if they do, they do not have a large back leg like crickets do. Another interesting insect are the scorites. This is a type of ground beetle. It's about the largest one that we have. And they have an important role in biological control. Uh, they feed on small insects and sometimes big insects. And these are masters of theatrics. So this short video is gonna show you someone who comes close to one and they'll play dead anywhere for a few seconds. So sometimes two minutes, if you come close to them, um, they think they're gonna fool people. So here's the video. And notice it just stops, doesn't move. And it was moving a moment ago and you can touch it and it will not move. So this is the, the actor of, um, of the beetles. How would you find this beetle? Uh, you would have to dig around in the soil or set up a pitfall trap, which is a cup that is uh, dug in the ground and set flush with the soil surface because these are only active at or beneath the soil and um, typically at nighttime. This is another really cool insect, not beneficial, uh, not a pest either, also tightly beneficial at one point. It's a Midas fly. Um, it is not a wasp, even though its antennae look just like a wasp and its body looks just like a wasp, but it is a fly because it only has one pair of wings. They feed on nectar as adults and as larvae, um, they're predators of grubs. And they're big, one to two inches in length. And I tend to see them in playground wood chips very frequently. I don't know why they like wood chips on playgrounds. This is one that there's really not a lot of research uh, on them. I, I asked the curator at the Michigan uh, bug house about information about with, where these have been found in Michigan. And there are very few records and most that's known about Midas flies is from the sixties. So hard one to study because they fly fast and uh, there are not a lot of them. Another interesting insect are the tiger beetles. Uh, sometimes they are bright green in color, sometimes they're black, uh, typically found in um, beaches and dunes, not so much on this side of the state, but more on the west side, but you can find them in gardens as well. Uh, because they're a big beetle, they're a good predator that can feed on a bigger insects. And these take a, a wait and kill approach, whereas some insects, uh, they will fly and stalk their prey. Uh, these ones just will stick around and build a little burrow in a sandy spot. Uh, when something walks on top of it, they pounce up and they grab their prey. The nabids or damsel bugs are another beneficial insect. Unlike the other ones, these belong to an insect order, the hemiptera, which contain a lot of pests. So they have a piercing sucking mouth part, but it's not used for sucking plant juices. It is used uh, for sucking the juices out of other insects. So they feed on larvae. They can feed on potato beetle larvae, caterpillars, and other soft-bodied uh, insects. Uh, my colleague, uh, Nate Walton, and I, we published a Michigan Insects in the Garden series. And one of our uh, articles this year on damselbugs uh, has more information about them, including identification to the species level, if you really want to challenge, because we have some damsel bugs that are brown and some that are black. Uh, these are the tussock moths, beautiful hairy moths um, that you should not touch because they have uh, what's called urticating hairs or hairs that can irritate predators or other things try to touch them and in some people cause an irritation. And this one was actually found on my three-year-old uh, son. We were on a hike one day and he just points this out and says, what? what's this interesting caterpillar? Thankfully he didn't touch it, but they're often really colorful. Unfortunately, they feed on a, a variety of plants. Surfed flies are a beneficial insect. 
And they're a double bonus because as adults, they pollinate, not very well because they don't have the same hair as the bees do. And typically found on asters and other smaller flowers. And as larvae, they're a predator. They don't look like much, but they will feed on aphids and thrips and other soft-bodied insect uh, pests. How do you recognize them as adults? Uh, they are kind of like um, the, hover, the uh, hummingbirds of the fly world because they'll wag their abdomens up and down and hover in midair. The last good insect I'm gonna talk about are the robber flies. Uh, they have a name that sounds very ominous, but they're actually quite beneficial. Uh, they have a lot bristly hairs on their body. Some of them are really good mimics of uh, bees. And uh, we have about a hundred or so species in Michigan. They feed on lots of things, grasshoppers, honeybees, flies, even wasps uh, sometimes. And as larvae, they also feed on, on uh, other insects like grubs and, and wireworms. And, and they're one of the few beneficial insects that feeds on other adults. They've accepted the challenge of uh, doing that. So I've just covered a lot of different insect groups and not nearly all of them that we have in Michigan. So hopefully I didn't make your brains explode uh, from, from all this with all this great knowledge. But I wanna give some tips about how to identify insects because there, there are resources out there that are more friendly uh, to the um, person who's just getting started as, as well as someone who might be more familiar with insects. So one of the first things to do is take a look at the, the type of wings it has, whether it flies and where you found it. You find it in a flower, in the soil, midair in flight, and that might tell you what order it could belong to. It is possible to identify another or one of these insects or other ones to the family or the genus level with a couple different uh, resources online. Bugguide.net, really nice resource. Uh, you can post photos on there, uh, but it can take a lot of time sometimes for them to be identified. And you can also search through photos of insects and there's an information tab that tells you where they're found, how to identify them, really useful. Um, material on there. There's the Michigan Insects in the Garden series, uh, which my uh, colleague Nate Welton and I have published last summer and this summer. We have about 24 insects in total. So if you search Michigan Insects in the Garden, uh, MSU, you'll find that. We've tried to profile things, including some from tonight, that are um, a little less common yeah, in the garden. Ask Extension is another good place. You can submit questions of what is this or search for pictures of insects. Other universities uh, have resources about insect ID. Uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation happens to have a really strong insect identification page as well. Now, it, one thing about Ask Extension is if you are using it to identify insects, please make reasonable requests. Uh, you wanna know what family it is or what something is, that's fine. But don't ask us uh, what species of aphid or what species of beetle this is. That, that takes a lot of time and often very specialized keys uh, that we are unable to do with a photo alone. And if you are trying to identify to the species um, and you're really interested in that, there, the place to find that is unfortunately dichotomous keys in scientific journals. They're not always very friendly um, to use, but I'm happy to point you in the right direction if you wanted to try to use one or you were looking for one in the future. So one quiz question I have for everyone here. I've talked a little bit about insects and I gave a hint about what makes a fly. Does anyone know which one of these is the bee? And feel free to use your annotate function. You might see three dots that say more and it might say annotate on there. You can use that to draw where you think the, the bee is, or you can just put it in the chat, upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. Which one do you think is a bee? And it's not a trick question. One of these is a bee. Okay. So we have one guess. Again, chat or annotate. Either of those would be okay.
bottom right, lower left, lower left, four wings and a bee, two wings and a fly. Says Lucy, lower left. So we have uh, some people think lower left. That seems to be slightly more, but we also have upper right. And I think someone said lower right as well. So no one said this one. And the reason it's not this one is there's only one pair of wings. That's pretty obvious here. This is a good guess for B because it looks a lot like a B, but it doesn't have the branched hairs that most bees have. Not, it does have some hairs in the leg, but not hairy enough. And this one is actually not a bee either. Uh, this is one of those robber flies, but it looks just like a bumblebee. I could see why you would think that. It has the antennae, it has the fuzz, but there's only one pair of wings. There's no second one back here. And even the venation on the wings, just really realistic. So this is the bee right here. Two pairs of wings, hairs on the head, more hairs on the leg, on the abdomen, and especially on the back leg. And this is a bright green sweat bee. And we have these all over uh, Michigan. So insect ID sometimes poses challenges because of mimicry, but it is possible. So at this point, I would welcome any questions you have about the insects we discussed tonight or any other insects or insect related questions that you wanted to talk about. For those of you with questions, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and ask or use a chat still if you want as well. Um, I did have a question for you. You talked about the Colorado potato beetle in the beginning. Do those attack anything other than just potatoes or are they pretty? So the, the Colorado potato beetle can sometimes attack other plants in the Solanaceae family, which potatoes belong to. So secondary hosts are eggplants and peppers, but typically potato is their preferred host. So sometimes as a trap crop, uh, farmers will put out a row of eggplants or another row of tomato, or not tomato, excuse me, a potato outside of their field so that the potato beetles get to that area first and they spray just that strip that's the closest to the field edge. I said tomato, but they don't typically feed on tomato. Pepper and eggplant sometimes, but usually potato. Then we had a question on how to get rid of stink bugs. I don't have a good answer for you. Uh, outdoors, there's not a whole lot you can do. Hope that the beneficials will do their job. Indoors, if they make it inside, uh, you can set up a type of light trap. So if they're buzzing in your ceiling and you're trying to get them down, you put a foil pan or some type of other tray with soapy water in it and then shine a, a, a light onto the, on the, um, the tray. And the insects will be attracted to the light. So if you turn the lights off in that room or wait till it's night, they'll fly into the light and they'll fall directly into the, the water trap and die in there. If they're outside of the home, let's see, you have hundreds on the side, you can just use a, a jet on your hose to knock them down and just try to squish as many as you can. And I see another comment, uh, people posting about stink bugs biting or causing disease, that is not true. Uh, stink bugs do not have a chewing mouth part. They do not bite people. Lady beetles sometimes can, and st uh, stink bugs do not transmit any disease. They just smell a bit. And personally, I don't think the smell is that bad. I think it's kind of like cilantro, uh, where either you find the smell okay or just nasty. And they smell a little like a, a rotting fruit almost. So it's not a pleasant smell, but it's not one that would make me uh, gag either. So, David, um, are all of the insects that you mentioned in your in the last part of your lecture um, all beneficial insects? Everything about, except for the tussock moth, I realized that that probably should have been moved earlier. And, and are they also parasitoids? Uh, so, so that's a good point. So a parasitoid can be a, a beneficial insect. 
Um, some of them are neutral, like the blister beetle, because it doesn't have any negative impact to, to humans. But the parasitoids, from the perspective of, of people and gardeners, they're good because they're attacking other insects that would feed on plants. But from the perspective of the insect that's being killed, yeah, they're not good if you're, if you're the fly or you're the beetle or um, you know, the grasshopper that's being killed. But generally, parasitoids are beneficial. So, so the, all the ones that you mentioned are not parasitoids. Of the ones that you mentioned, which ones are parasitoids besides yeah, the so, wasp? So let's go back. The ichno, the okay, the golden digger wasp. Um, technically, a that's a parasitoid because it lays an egg on the outside of another insect. Um, this is a, a the chrysidid can be a parasitoid. It depends on how it attacks the um, the insect, and ichnomonids and braconids are parasitoids. The difference between a parasitoid and a predator is parasitoids typically don't kill their host immediately. They let they develop on the host. A predator does not develop on the host. It just feeds on, on the insect that it collects. Whereas these gals here, they need their host to complete their life cycle. They have to lay their egg on the host or in the host. A predator does not need a host to lay its egg on or near. It just needs that for feeding. So good question. David, do you have like a top five or so plants that you would suggest to attract some of these parasitoids in particular or other beneficial insects into our garden? Yeah. I'm gonna name a few. I'm not gonna say they're they're top five necessarily, but plants that have clusters of flowers that bees like are generally good. So, and, and ones with short um, flowers, not things that are deep and, and tubular. So blazing star is a good one. Um, asters, all types of asters are, are really good for parasitoids. Uh, so anything that falls within the aster family would, would be good. Uh, flat top flowers like dill and yarrow, and also herbs. Uh, so, um, Lovage, mint, parasitoids, especially some of the bigger ones, they, they love mints. You'll see these big black wasps all over mints in the middle and, and late summer. So that's not five specific types, but I've given you types with clusters and I've told you about the aster family, which tends to be really good for uh, parasitoids. They're mostly wasps, it seems. Yes. Uh, so there are some parasitoids that are flies as well. Um, and they're parasitoids that attack things that are not plant pests. So there are flies that are pests of livestock and there are um, parasitoid flies that will attack those flies as well. Um, I'm not, I don't usually talk about those because they're only relevant if you have cattle or you know, horses that might be attacked by flies. If anybody else had any questions, feel free to unmute and ask away. So if you had a plant that had a bunch of holes in it, how would you go about trying to figure out what kind of what insect it was that was after it? Yeah. <laughs> the first thing is what is the plant? And when did it occur? What do the holes look like? That, that, that will clue you into it because there's some pests that are only active at different times of the season. So if it were just, you know, skeletonized holes, that would make me think it's some kind of leaf feeding beetle, potentially a caterpillar too. Um, if much of the foliage is, is missing, that'd probably be a, a caterpillar. And then I showed you those, those circles of the leaf feeding insect. So it's all about knowing what the plant is too, because some insects specialize on um, different types of plants. Like on trees, there are locust spores, which they um, lay their larvae within the wood of, of, of locust. So the, the tree ID or host ID, the appearance of the hole and time of year would be the, the three things to think about first. And that'll help you 
narrow it down. But typically when there's holes, it's usually beetles, sometimes caterpillars. It just depends on, on the plant. And yep, that natural enemies uh, tool from the Landis lab is a good one. And it does have some um, information about plants that are good for natural enemies. And you, so I appreciate you sharing that. And you'll see that there's a, a pretty strong overlap between what's good for natural enemies and what's good for, for bees too. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation tonight, David, and that, that you've shared with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Hope you picked up something new about insects and feel inspired to take a closer look at what you find next on the planet. Thank you so much. So just to just to close out our meeting here. Thank you again, David. It was really interesting presentation. Appreciate it. Um, oh, am I sharing my screen? I think I am. Maybe I'm not. Can people see my screen? Or I just see we... your face, that's all. <laughs> oh, Lord. I used to be good at this. Blame COVID. <clears throat> yeah, we'll blame everything but me. Okay. How about now? Any better? Now we have your your slide. Yeah. Thank you, David. <laughs> oh, hey, David, you want to you want to identify all these these uh, insects I threw on there? That's a gimme. Let's see. Um, stink bug. You got a lady beetle, box elder, spotted lantern fly. Hopefully, which you did not find here. No, not yet. And oh man, um, the monarch. I, I guess it's a monarch. It could be the sneaky uh, other I one. Think, I, don't know. I don't think it has the, um, so the viceroy has the vertical lines along okay. the right. I don't see that on here. I, I just grabbed a couple of pictures because I thought we are. And I, I think the lady beetle you have here is one of our native ones, a uh, harmonia. Okay. And lady beetle, I think. But the, there's, there's lady beetles of Ohio online, which is really good for identifying them to species. Okay. So um, just for everyone, the next meeting is on November 9th, and uh, Sue Greba will talk to us about healthy soils. So hope that uh, you, you call me and let me know you want to be president, vice president, or treasurer between now and then, and uh, look forward to seeing you again on the 9th. You guys have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.